So, Jason, I don't know because you're the chair if you want to kick things off or if you want to kind of go through what you hope to accomplish or and now I, I can doing. piggyback on there. Yeah, what I was just going to do, Michael, if it's okay, is just do a brief overview of uh, what happened during the uh, and I, when, I mean, very brief because I emailed everyone. Yep. <clears throat> just a brief overview of what uh, what we found and what I believe you are looking for moving forward. Yep, go right ahead. So about a month and a half ago, myself and Michael, as everyone knows, toured the facilities. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into detail. That's why I emailed everyone the information. Yes. Um, we're in dire need of some maintenance and upgrades. And more on the maintenance side, it's, it's pretty, uh, it was pretty eye-opening to see the lack of maintenance that's gone on in the in the district and what the consequences may be for uh, not addressing them soon. So myself and Mike talk during that. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we can incorporate into future capital projects. Um, and knowing that uh, he's getting ready to kick off a capital project, I wouldn't be surprised if he's uh, addressed some of it. With it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that being said, um, I didn't see any emails from anybody yes. regarding questions or things they'd like to talk yeah. about. So I'm gonna assume that uh, nobody had anything. Is that accurate? Keen, is that accurate from your point of view as well? Okay. Okay, so perfect. Um, with that being said, uh, I'll let Michael go into what he has because basically what I have is just uh, specific points of things and um, kind of an urgency table of what we should address first and going and moving forward. In my opinion, that's Michael's decision. Um, but the, the one thing that I did want to hit on at some point today is possibly discussing a checklist type thing for our board and future boards to uh, be presented with maybe periodically throughout the year uh, from different buildings on uh, walk arounds that they do just so it's just an idea I had to maybe edge off this happening again down the road. So part of what Jason started to talk about really comes down to um, some of this type of stuff. Can you see this now? So we have right here some of the masonry work that you know we took them. This is a view of the high school gymnasium. Um, this right here, I believe, is the eastern wall. And what you'll see is it, you can't really tell about it through screen, but on in person, these bricks are bowed out like piano keys. And some of these mortar joints, if you look at right here, for example, right here, here, some of this stuff where it's noticeably white, that's caulk. They've, they've used caulk as a band-aid to replace where the mortar joints started to fade away. This is also a picture of the high school gymnasium roof. This is actually on the Western side and you see how the water is collecting over here. This roof is 30 years old. Right where my cursor is right now, that's a bubble. This roof, is, the rubber membrane is so dry when you walk on it, it's like walking on popcorn from packaging. If you look at how this is, there's a pitch here in particular and it's supposed to bring things back toward the drain, but the pitch is not really adequate. Here's another, <coughs> this is the, excuse me, <coughs> this is the southwest corner of the gymnasium. This bubble here, if you were to look at it in proximity to what a flat surface would look like, this is raised about 12 inches because last winter when the weather took hold of it, it blew the membrane up and it captured air in there and it never sat back down. Here's a component of the maintenance building roof. Oh. Yep. You can see how it's ponding. You can see the bubbles. 
this roof is also need a dire need of being replaced. It's to the point where earlier this fall, I had to have a roofing company come in and actually patch um, the roof because the leak was so profound that it was going through the metal truss below and rusting the metal truss and the tr rust was getting down onto the actual hood of our brand new dump truck. So it's a perpetual thing. Um, it's something that when we talk about necessity, the high school gymnasium roof right here, um, our, our rough estimate for an emergency situation would have been minimally 500 grand last year. With the cost of goods escalating, there's a projection of that being an 880,000 to a million dollar roof. If we don't go through with a project and we don't go through with um, the ability to capture state aid and utilize some capital project reserves, we don't have a million dollars of extra money just laying around to repair one particular thing. This roof, we hope we can band-aid it through this winter. We hope that with this committee support and with the entire board support, we can put a vote out to our public in December to try and address some of this. And our priority obviously would be on this roof because again, you have the gymnasium below, you have the fitness center component on the side of it, and you have some other things that are actually taking shape um, that from an asset preservation, obviously water and wood don't mix well together. If we continue to deal with wood um, being saturated by water, we have a potential to have to replace the gymnasium floor if it continued to permeate. Um, and my understanding is because some of this stuff here where my cursor is now, this was a former skylight. There's a skylight here, a skylight there. They have actually had to cancel sporting contests in the past because of saturation. Are any of you aware of that? No. Okay. So I believe two years ago, they had to cancel a, a basketball game because the roof was leaking and they couldn't keep the um, playing surface dry. So those types of things there are just a few of the items that I'll bring to the entire board next week as part of my superintendent's report. Um, under our projection, and obviously I don't have time to share everything with you, but we'll share a lot with you next week. Under our proposed plan that we'd like to move forward, for the elementary building, instead of continuing to focus $100,000 on capital outlay projects year after year after year and never actually doing it, we're going to just try and tackle the window replacement and masonry work all in one fell swoop. You know, because we could continue to put $100,000 in the window replacement and do that for the next 10 years, only to have to turn around and start putting money back into something else in year 11, because we haven't maintained it all at the same status. So my pictures next Thursday will start to reference some of the need for the masonry work being repaired, the windows being taken care of all at once. And then as part of that, you know, on the gymnasium, you understand there's broken windows that currently exist in the gym. Um, there's those metal panels that are on the outside that you may remember from our walkthrough last year. And we haven't done our building walk for the elementary or transportation department yet. We've only accomplished our walkthrough for um, the high school and the um, middle school facility. So we need to do maintenance and elementary and transportation still. But part of this remediation would address the panels on the outside and the windows. That would be the bulk of the asset preservation there because the roof is still in pretty good shape. From the athletic complex, when Jason talked about our walkthrough, you know, and you saw this when we met in July, I believe it was July 8th, we took our tour. 
the the track here um, is the surface itself is over 20 years old. Typically a track surface of this nature has a life expectancy of 10 to 12 years. We're starting to see gaps in the turf, or excuse me, not the turf, the gaps in the surface um, where, you know, those are tripping hazards. And also it's something that, again, from an asset preservation, my hope is that because we've neglected redoing the surface, um, that we don't have to do a whole lot of site work underneath it. But our, our focal point will be, you know, to do this correctly and then get into a regular routine of maintaining it. On top of that, under area number two, one piece that we would propose is that the concession stand as it currently exists is not an adequate space for our concession stand, nor does it have restroom facilities for any of our spectators. In fact, homecoming weekend, we did get some feedback. Scott specifically got feedback from a few parents referencing the, the length, you know, the length of the walk from here, area three, over to this corner, area five, where spectators have to travel to use restroom facilities. And under COVID conditions, one of the things that you know is we're focused on cleaning and sanitizing. And so if the maintenance staff comes through and cleans this and sanitizes this, and then we have spectators continuing to travel back and forth, back and forth, we can't always ensure that it's a sanitized environment. And the fear is that potentially, you know, you could bring a contaminant into a location that's now part of the physical structure of the high school. Whereas a standalone facility that's accessible to all and, and a wider, cleaner, inviting facility would be beneficial to all spectators, home and away. And also could be utilized for instructional purposes while kids are out here during phys ed class. Under three, it's the new press box and bleachers. Um, the bleachers are not ADA compliant, as you've heard me say before. Our, our primary use for those bleachers during the fall season, men's and women's soccer, um, really well attended by our community, um, but yet for our wheelchair bound or mobility uh, impaired staff, spectators and visitors uh, alike, there is no way for them to sit up and enjoy the same point of view as able-bodied people who can walk up the stairs and sit. So trying to correct that would be an issue. And in addition to that, the press box on number three with the dugouts and the press box, those were um, a donation. My understanding is it was a community group came in, donated the labor and the materials and installed those um, dugouts and press box years and years ago. We had to put about 12 grand into um, beefing up the system as a whole, just so that we had the right audio so that we could actually broadcast games. And then in terms of uh, capacity and weight limits, you, you know, we, we really feel like we've run its course or the facility itself has run its course with bringing people in there to either commentate or spectate from the press box. So if we can go through and in, in one foul swoop, go ahead and take care of that. We want to do that. We want to do so. You've heard and seen pictures on four and five, um, the masonry stuff. And then in terms of the transportation department, um, there are some things there that we want to go ahead and correct. Actually, before I do that, inside the building where my cursor is now, we want to do some stuff and I'll, I'll come back up. Um, we want to do some stuff to renovate the actual high school auditorium, which is here. I just showed it on the exterior. We, we have an auditorium right now that is also not ADA compliant in respect to people that would run the equipment. 
There's obviously some areas that are cut out for wheelchair bound community members, students and participants, but it's not as ADA compliant as it needs to be. There is no sound attenuation panel. The lighting in the auditorium is not adequate. And you know, from our previous presentations, we have to use a floor mounted system whenever we're projecting anything to a screen and that becomes an issue <laughs> for visual impairment <clears throat> for anyone sitting at the front of the auditorium who may be presenting or for people who are looking to actually see something broadcast professionally. So this would get, the seats would be taken out because the, the material is starting to fail in there. The carpets would be taken out. We would add a new coat of paint new lighting system, new rigging for the stage, um, more handicap accessibility for sound board and controls, and then also um, just general appearance. We think that that would be something for our students in the performing arts band, uh, musicals, those types of things, chorus, that would be beneficial. In terms of the classroom facilities, as you know, we want to go ahead and take the area that you see marked under number two. Um, we want to start making some more of our alternative learning center classrooms, a little bit more conducive to an alternative pathway for some of our high school students. You saw that we started to do some demolition on certain walls this, for this past year um, to make it a little bit more conducive to what we're trying However, that's only scratching the surface when it comes down to growing the program to the capacity that we want. We want to take room 140 and 141 and turn those into like a large group instruction slash board meeting room. So for our future Board of Education meetings, we would have one particular area which would be conducive to a large conference room and board meeting room. And then throughout the day, as students from the high school wanted to have a large group uh, presentation, large group instruction, if Scott had a presenter come in, um, people would travel from the high school down to this particular area that would be a little bit more equipped for that type of setup. As part of that, the district office would get reconfigured as well so that these areas here would start being, you know, pass throughs to some point, but it would be set up in such a way where, you know, students would stop entering into this space during the work day. And it would be an exclusive setup that only time people would be entering through here would be to use the large group instruction accompanied by adults or during an event where, you know, the system was enacted, the doors would open up so people could exit. But also one of the things that I heard loud and clear would be right here on this um, end of the building, the far east end of the building, this parking lot, which is over here where my cursor is, really needs to be more conducive to physical impairment. So we would make a handicap accessible entrance here so that it's a little bit easier for people who need to enter into the district office to do business, that they would park over in this particular area, have some handicap preferred parking spots, and then a secured entrance here. Likely the entrance two for the current district office setup would be taken out of commission and people would have to enter in on this east side of the building and then parking again for more community members that need to come in and out would have a little bit easier accessibility to the building and still be contained in a safe and secure environment um, through this east end entrance. And then again, maintenance building, you saw the roof. We wanna do some roof repairs to that. We just put a significant amount of money into the Leavenworth building. We've done nothing to this particular building. My goal would be to do again, a, a rubber membrane next spring if this project passed, use that space for what it's intended and then continue to enhance 
because physically the bricks are in great shape, physically enhance the building by doing the roof during a project and then piecing out these doors, which are banged up and, and not airtight through mm -hmm. some of our typical annual budget stuff. Okay. So really what we're trying to do is get people to understand as, as Jason said, there's been a lot of neglect in terms of um, maintenance and, and it appears like the preventative maintenance program was non-existent. So we've been correcting that, as you know, by hiring more maintenance staff and we're almost to the point where we have a fully staffed maintenance staff and we have three building custodians again, which has been a huge benefit to the district. We think it's hard for those people to catch up and keep up. Therefore, we think if we move forward with a proposed project um, that costs the taxpayers nothing out of pocket, that this would be a very worthy cause to dip into our capital reserves and put forth a vote to give our students and our community uh, a world-class facility and then get back on track with making sure that we're being a little bit more strategic with capital projects and bringing in the skilled labor to address the things that our staff just can't handle because we're not equipped um, and then turn it over to our, our maintenance staff for a preventative maintenance program to keep things intact in a very successful manner. One of the things, um, thank you for doing that, Michael. It uh, was exactly pretty close to what I had pictured you were gonna do. Um, one of the things that uh, really hit me when we were touring the buildings were the attention that both Bill and Michael not only put on the um, maintenance and schedules of the building, but community perception. And Michael was continually saying that uh, we, we come from a small community and an engaged community, and we need to make sure that when they enter the buildings, they feel like we're taking good care of them. Um, <clears throat> and that ties into what I believe is his uh, ultimate goal of a community school. Um, having the community have trust within um, their district for us to do good by uh, the money that they spend. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that because leaving that day, it meant a lot to me to hear him say that and Bill say that multiple times. Um, you know, we're heading in the right direction. I don't want this entirely to be negative uh, because that doesn't do anybody any good. I think that we've uh, addressed the concerns within the district Michael and his team have put together a great plan on um, correcting them and moving forward, we can learn from this and uh, put, in, put forth some expectations as to how we're gonna uh, minimize the chances of it happening again. One of the questions that I didn't ask the other day, Michael, and I think it's important, when you put things like the track out for bid, do we have anyone within the district that investigates alternatives um, You know, in the car business uh, we, we have the but this, but this is you came in to look at a new Ram, Ram sold, but we have this. Um, and a lot of times they'll buy the but this. I, I just want to make sure that uh, with all the new people that we have in administration that somebody is focusing on, maybe company A offers a great product, but com company B offers a similar product that's almost as good that might suit us. Do we have somebody that does that, Michael? Well, if, the, if we were doing it in-house, the, the facilities director would work with the athletic director. So case in point would be Mark Blankenberg did get us quotes on, you know, what it would cost to repair the track and, you know, what it would look like for a short-term solution. So the, to answer your question in a short fashion, the answer is yes. Okay. You know, is it cost friendly? No. You know, if just looking at our, our track, that's a pretty significant dollar amount. I don't have a figure in front of me, so I don't want to throw it out there to quote it. But yes, we do do that. And we are looking at it to the point where, again, if we go ahead and take that off, off our bucket list now, that in 10 to 12 years, people are understanding there's been 10 to 12 years worth of 
preventative maintenance that's gone into this new surface to make sure that if we can do it in-house, we will. But if we can piece it out a little bit at a time, we'll do that also. Because the tennis court is also an area that is a concern. And I want to say the figure that we received to rehab that this year would be upwards of $75,000. You know, and that's in pretty good shape. But again, if you think about $75,000, you know, that's the equivalent of a teacher, a starting teacher salary and benefits with a family plan. And right now, we're not to the point where we need to, you know, spend $75,000 on the uh, surface of the tennis courts. But in the near future, we're going to have to do something. And it came to light that the surface wasn't redone in the past six years. That's also something to say if we were on a biannual basis, that maybe that $75,000, because we've paid attention to the routine maintenance, is only the equivalent of 10, then that comes out of our building budget. So we will always look for alternatives. Uh, part of our methodology with hiring a senior maintenance mechanic was to bring some more skill and capacity in house so that every time we need a repair, it's not going out to a bid at a prevailing rate. rate. Um, but it is something that we start to figure out, do we have the tools in our tool chest to do in house? And then if it comes becomes a project, Jason, obviously it's set up for a bid. And on most items that are over a certain dollar amount, we require three bids anyway. Um, but you know, the, the common mindset unfortunately with state projects becomes the lowest bidder, not always the best quality. Um, but that, that would, would prevail here as well. Even if we did a small repair for the $75,000 quote we received, we would still need two other competing quotes to make sure we got the taxpayers the most effective and cost affordable option. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, what's everyone think? I'd like to hear your opinions at Go least. For it. I think the, I think the community will be right behind all of the maintenance issues that you're, you're talking about, uh, particularly when they see the condition of things, the amount of time that, that they lasted and that they're not um handicapped accessible and don't need standards today um i i think we are a community of very conservative people who when we spend our money we take care of what we have built or bought um and i think they'll be behind that i think they'll probably say it's about time i agree I, I things have been let go for so long and it's so obvious just the sports facility alone is going to push for this so I, I i really i think it's time i think people are going to agree and we need to get on board and get going well what i'd like for our community here and at large to understand is we can really capitalize on the state mm -hmm. aid method by bringing more proactivity to capital projects. Like Leavenworth has left a bad taste in many people's mouth because it became something of uh, an albatross, not because of the end product, but because the timelines weren't met as promised. But it's caused us to get off cycle with respect to doing preventative maintenance. So. I think if we can get this small project, which is gonna, it's gonna amount to about $11.1 .1 million, we can get this one under our belt and get it under motion. Then our next step would be to get another project scheduled so that about every year to two years, we're doing projects and bringing in skilled labor to kind of bring our facility up to the point, point where everybody can accept it and say, okay, we now feel like we've hit a certain standard and met our threshold, now keep it up and then start talking away more money. 
you know, and that's mm -hmm. the good thing about being in the buildings or being on a mower or being on a roof. You start to see it and you start to ask yourself the question, how did it get to this point? We've already started our um, building condition survey for 2022. We, we entered into an agreement with SEI. So they're already starting our um, building condition survey to give us the blue what needs to be addressed. So, and, and we're, we're working on that. And, you know, we have to submit that to the state and the board will have to uh, agree to seeing all that and signing off on that. We'll submit that to the state, but we're proactively already started that last spring just to get ourselves in a position to say, okay, once we do this asset preservation project, what do we want to tackle next in terms of priorities? Like air conditioning would be a great one for the elementary building. Jason? The only reason I'm jumping in is because that was the next thing I would talk about or at least bring up. And I had a little spiel about it, I guess. Um, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, buildings weren't packed with the technology that they are today. There weren't wires, as many wires running through the walls. There weren't modems, computers, things like that. And I was going to bring up the air conditioning at the elementary school as a asset preservation enhancement because climate controlled buildings, I mean, if you leave a building dormant for a long time with no heat or air conditioning, it deteriorates faster. Um, asset preservation for that elementary school, knowing that in the coming years, we're probably going to invest some technology on top of what's already there we may want to consider doing that now so that the build or now or soon so that the building is prepared for those enhancements down the road. We um, are. Yeah, on the flip side, it's a more comfortable work environment for people, but there is a, an asset preservation portion that ties into that as well. So you're right from a local standpoint, what I would tell you is we don't have enough in our reserves to bring that in under this umbrella. However, what we are looking to do and what we have started to prepare is a presentation using our federal money um, to offset some of the need for air conditioning for the learning environment, right? So they, like there's this, the federal money, the part of the Recovery Act the era funds that you've heard about, the American Recovery Act, mm -hmm. where what we're, we had to do for them was propose what we would spend a certain portion of money on for capital improvements and how would we work to do that. So we are taking that federal money, which you know will run out in September 30th of 2024, and we're allocating a certain portion of that federal funding toward just that. We have a climate controlled middle school now. We wanna take that air conditioning unit that's sitting in front of the high school. And we've got plans in motion to try and get that unit installed on the high school like it was originally intended for. And then our goal would be to make sure that we're putting a, a climate controlled or as close to climate controlled environment together for our elementary school. So that would be a separate entity from this particular proposal that's gonna go forth um, next Thursday night, but that is, we do have wheels in motion on that. Perfect. And then the one other thing that I wanted to touch on today, um, <clears throat> as far as maintenance and preservation is uh, our lack of storage area for equipment. Um, it's all over. And when we, me and Michael were walking through the middle school and Bill, I, I looked at him and I said, how many hours a week or a month do our employees jump from building to building because we have stuff spread out? And the response was, well, they're always in a truck. That's why we're looking for a crew cab truck to go from one place to another, um, possibly down the road, um, because it affects them and it affects their job performance. So I think is maybe not an immediate uh, action, but maybe short term, next two couple of years, maybe we wanna consider figure out a way or a plan to centralize all of our equipment and give it, give us the opportunity to store them inside because um, it just deteriorates the equipment, leaving it outside all the time faster than we need it to. And there's no reason to spend um, more money than we need to as well, as well, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, so 
it doesn't look like that's going to make it into this capital project, but just keep it in the back of your minds that uh, that is one of the issues that buildings and grounds and maintenance has is not knowing exactly where everything is all the time. Am I correct in putting it that way, Michael? Yep. And, and I do have to, to piggyback on that. I do have Bill working to get a quote on extending the pole barn on the high school campus to address some of that. You know, we have a pole barn up at the um, south end of the track, which is really good shape, but it was never big enough and it's not adequate for the equipment to be stored inside. And I think that, Cinda, your point about, you know, being a conservative community and when we spend money, we take care of what we purchase, that's our mindset as well. So if we could double the size of that pole barn, you know, without going through a project, we're going to look into the potential for using our, um, our operating money out of the general fund to do so, you know, because for our purposes, you know, we can stagger that in phases. If we put six by sixes in the ground and we put the metal materials up and, you know, we, we get the equipment out of the elements, we don't necessarily need to have the concrete poured um, this year. But if we can do it in a very fiscally responsible way and then accomplish what Jason just said, get everything into one place right now for the short term, and then for the long term, I do agree with him. I think we need to look at a joint operation center between our transportation department and our maintenance department so that we can capitalize on efficiencies when it comes down to our mechanics servicing our equipment and taking care of what we have. Because we, we, we really, our, our transportation department, um, I won't get into the extent of what it needs right now, um, but it's it's served its purpose and it's probably um, exceeded its life expectancy. But I think, again, from an efficiency standpoint, one of the things that I know is we send two people over to South Butler to get salt for our trucks for the winter to plow. And that's inefficient because if we're taking a two man crew over there every time we need salt, that's two men that are not or two women that are not on campus salting our yard and or our driveway and parking lots um, because they're on the road to go get the salt. And so it's an inefficiency and it might save us a little bit of money per ton in rock salt, but it doesn't save us anything labor wise. And it certainly makes us more inefficient when it comes down to actually doing the work. So there's a lot of different angles to take but I think when I put the presentation together for Thursday night, show, show people actual images of what we're trying to address and then kind of talk about the um, steps that we're taking proactively to get this to the community this year so that we can be early to bid next year. I think people will welcome that, really do. Uh, were you able to... Uh or not you, but were they able to get those uh, block heater power sources fixed? I actually just got a quote from O'Connell last week, and I'm, and I'm waiting to see if we can get a PO cut. Thankfully, O'Connell is doing a lot of work up and down um, 104 installing telephone poles. Oh. So we have an electrician that we've contracted with to fix the actual area where the um, power source was cut, but we have to fix the, the power pole itself, the actual telephone pole, which is district owned. We have to take that out, replace it, and run the utilities from the poles that are going down Salter, Colvin Road now, and then get them to the new telephone pole to fix it. But that is in motion. Awesome, awesome. And again, that was something that we knew about allegedly uh, three or four years ago because the actual vandalism occurred three or four years ago and nobody ever took the time to repair it. And so this year when we went to repair it, we were told that telephone pole has to come out because that's a hazard. So that's a part where we're addressing it now. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> 
I have a, a thought about the district office. Um, if the entrance is going to end up being on the east side of the high school, um, I wonder if it would be a more efficient thing for people using the district office to put the offices on the east end and the conference rooms where the current offices are. Um, thinking again about people entering, going to see you or the, the treasurer or, you know, conducting some sort of business. It would also save um, uh, the high school kids using that from walking through the whole thing. Right. You know, I just, I think that whole thing needs to be thought through to get it the best be. offices we can. Right, it, it will be. So that high school, the main entrance of the high school will still be in play. The part that might be looked at, and again, it's a might at this point, would be, um, it would only be a part where, let's see, I'm gonna see if I can share my screen with you again. Can you see this again? No, I don't see it yet. Okay. Well, it would only be where the current district office door um, setup is. That would be the only entryway impacted. So that would that would be the thing where right here when you walk into the district office currently. Yeah, we see it, yeah. Yeah. Right here, where right where that number two is, yeah. and this is the secure vestibule. This is the only potential impact, and the the linear footage from the east entrance to the district office would likely only be twenty because these are just mock up boards. And you're you're right. We don't want to take one if one inefficiency and bypass it and create another inefficiency. So I understand what you're saying. And this one very well could stay intact. Um, but right now it's just more of the conceptual stuff because this hallway for district office during the business hours won't be accessible because this will be set up on a badge system. It won't be accessible to students anymore. Yeah. So that that's the part we, we have to really think about all of that and say, okay, what is it that we're doing? It's such a problem for anyone going to the district office. You don't know where to park. Uh, you'd think, well, I'm gonna, you know, run in quick with a paper or something, and but then you're not supposed to park in the bus loop during the day. Um, going from the parking lot over is a fairly long walk. All that's going to be taken it's care of. So inefficient. Yep. And, and that when we walk with um, the group that we're meeting with right now, which is Pete Buckley from um, DGA Builders and John Paul Piane from uh, SEI and Sarah Bald from SEI, all those concerns have been brought forth. Like we know we need to do some more asphalt remediation on that east end. We know we have a um, secure barrier, a metal barrier at that north end, or excuse me, that east end that's gonna need to be moved north so that that physical barrier is still there so cars aren't driving around the building during the day and, unless it's a white pickup truck. Um, but it's a part where, yeah, all those things are certainly being factored in so that when we actually take the, the concept from concept to practice, all those concerns, we definitely are, are factoring them in. And, and the board that you saw is probably a rendition of three, right? We've seen two or three different variations. Is it just to give people some landmarks as to what we're trying to do? And then as it gets closer, um, you know, through the planning phases and things of that nature, we'll give some more specific detail. I think I think Cinda raised a good point, and uh, just as a recommendation, you're probably already thinking of it. 
put uh, some signage on that east mm -hmm. um, parking lot would probably go a long way uh, just to direct people for district office parking and then maybe like a vestibule like in a shopping mall or something to mm -hmm. give them an idea what which door it leads to what so that they knew how to get there. Yep, yeah. communication is definitely lacking here. I mean, the LED boards years and years ago were very cost prohibitive, but I'm of, my, of the mindset that when people drive by our building, if we have both signage and potentially messages scrolling, that you can communicate a lot of good things in a real short amount of time by just putting some information out there. And again, part of that work, you know, started with reorienting, or I shouldn't say reorienting, retrofitting um, our lighting at the high school campus last year. You know, those old dark and dingy lights were replaced with new LEDs. And so that's a first step and you're right, putting adequate signage up because the ones that are in front of the um, mailbox posts now really don't do a good job of drawing people's attention to where the district office is or where the high school entrance is and things of that nature. And I did actually ask the, the design team to start factoring in a similar type of entrance way to the east end of the building like we currently have right now with the high school's main entrance. So, Well, even the high school main entrance, if you're coming in and you need to stop in at the office, do you really have to park way over on the other side of the parking lot because there's no visitor parking? Right. Mm -hmm. that, that's handy. So, oh, there's Penis another boy. He was changing babies like my attention span. <laughs> Every 30 seconds, there's a new baby in her hand. That's Ooh, a good thing. Look at the hair on that guy. <laughs> um, this is George. <laughs> this is George. George is taking copious <laughs> notes. Look how attentive he is. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Jackson. <laughs> okay, we're doing well. We're okay. I'm listening. <laughs> you are. Holy cow, you're managing. So I think from our perspective, the one thing I need our committee to know is, and this is going to come out in my newsletter as well, I need to get a, an advertisement, a legal notice sent to the newspaper prior to Thursday night. Because if I wait until after the vote, I'll never meet the, the timeline for the newspaper to have the legal notice in and to the print. But what I'm hoping is that I can actually get permission from the entire board to send the legal ad ahead of time to our um, district approved newspapers mm -hmm. so that we get the legal notice in and then Thursday night, if the vote were not favorable by the entire board, pull the legal ad versus waiting. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And then on the, the the prospective vote date that we talked about would be December 16th. They okay. were set up in the lobby of the high school. There's a high school concert that evening. So we should be able to get a captive audience, see some of our performing arts and play. Um, and hopefully have a successful capital project vote. Mm -hmm. Great. That makes sense. But the vote would start early enough so that people who are not going to the concert would, yep. would be able to park. Yep. Even if we need to go get them from the visitor parking lot with our new athletic facility oh, golf cart, okay. we can do that. We'll put some winter tires on there and some chains. <laughs> I don't know, horse and sleigh. Right. Ooh. I might even set up hot chocolate outside if it wants to keep going. Okay. Anything else from the committee, Jason, that you want to discuss or any other questions, Tina or Cinda or Jason, you have? Nope, not at this point. I think I'm good, Michael. Uh, I think we touched on everything quickly and uh, we have a plan. That's all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. And I think to piggyback on some of this, part of our budget workshop at the conclusion of our public session next week, 
I am starting to compile lists of what equipment we have, you know, so when it comes down to allocating our resources in an appropriate fashion, you know, we have two payloaders. One seems to be an appropriate size. One seems like it's a little small for the work we're asking it to do. And whether the actual equipment is adequate size is one thing, whether the blade we put on it to plow snow in the winter is adequate is another. So we may have the right size payloader, but not the right size blade to move the amount of snow we need. Um, the pickup trucks that we use, you know, how, how often are we cycling those through and, and, you know, putting new equipment in there? And then the expectation, to be honest with you, we have a lot of equipment that gets banged up and instead of repairing it right away, we let it sit. And I think in my opinion, it sends the community the wrong message that when you have a $40,000 pickup truck sitting there that's banged up on one side and brand new on the other, why aren't we taking pride in our, our equipment and fixing it when a mistake happens? So we will add that into part of our preventative maintenance approach as well. And the guys have already done that. You know, Matt O'Neill, our new senior maintenance mechanic, Bill Bonville, director of facilities, are already starting to tackle some of those um, routines and schedules that need to be put in place. Um, and if we can do it in-house, we will. If it makes more sense to get somebody that's a trained technician from outside the district to do it, we'll do it. But we're trying to think about those things as well so that our asset preservation isn't just actually bricks and mortar, but it's actually the equipment and the, the mindset as well. And I'll bring some of that up in the budget workshop. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes. Great. All right, I'm going to I'm going to stop the recording and I, I want you to stay put for one second because you guys happen to be the same group that consists of a different uh, committee as well.